having the mic on. Yes. Leah, quick, can you check, see if the mic's on up there? Okay, great. The zoning board review is now in session. Um, just so everyone's aware, we have actually, although there's listed four petitions on here, there's one that will be continued. Um, there will be two residential and then the uh, petition of AP Enterprise. So to expedite things, we're gonna hear the two residential first, and then we will go on to the AP Enterprise one, which is probably why most people are here. Um, start with roll call, uh, Mr. Furell. Uh, present. Mr. Raposa. Here. Ms. Horowitz. Present. Mr. Donovan. Here. Chairman is here as well. Uh, Mr. Harris is absent. And of course we know Mr. Borden um, has stepped down. Um, next item on the agenda are the minutes of January 19th, February 16th, March 16th, April 20th, May 18th, May 25th, and June 15th of 2023. Could I have a motion to accept the minutes as presented? I'll make a motion to accept. Thank you, could I have a second? Second. second. Motion has been made and second to accept those um, minutes I read off as uh, presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, good to go. Okay, uh, jumping to number three on new business, petition of Noel Clavillo, uh, for property located 15 Atlantic Avenue, tax assessors map 29, lot 83, has requested a continuous to the August 17th meeting. Could I have a motion to continue that? No, no. Could I have a second? Second. Motion's been made and second to continue the petition of Noel Clavillo uh, to our regularly scheduled meeting of August 17th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So that brings us to our first petition, which is the petition of Paul. I'm just gonna ask everyone if, you know, um, most people who haven't been here before don't realize that the way this room is built, that the noise reflects up here. So you can actually almost whisper back there and we can hear it up here. So if you would be as kind as just try to keep the side chatter down, or if you really need to talk, just go outside, we'd appreciate it. Um, so the first petition we'll hear is a petition of Paul Connolly, applicant and owner for property located at 170 Rhode Island Boulevard, tax assessors map 4, lot 157, seeking a special use permit and a dimensional variance to construct a foreign porch, excuse me, increasing maximum percent lot coverage on a substandard lot of record. Hello. Hi. You? <laughs> Good. Raise your right hand. Swear to tell the truth. Honest to goodness. Could I have your full name and address if I have the please? Paula Connolly, 170 Rhode Island Boulevard. Okay, Paul, would you like to tell us what you'd like to do? Just want to put in a small porch, nothing special, no roof, off the front door. 23 by nine, and a railing, two steps. Actually going over what kind of already exists. it's already concrete most of it right which is an impervious surface so you're not looking for any dimensional variances at all no um in fact although the variance request says a 17.1 percent request you're actually only asking for a three percent lot coverage variance right mm -hmm. um and to the best of your knowledge, are there similar homes in the area right along you that have similar? Rooms? Yes, in the area. Okay, thank you. Questions for the? None. Okay, I do have to go through the special use criteria. So okay. I just need answers to the questions. Okay. So if this were to be allowed, would it allow would it allow adequate space for fire protection? Yes. Okay. Would it provide adequate light and air between buildings? Yes. Would it alter the character of the neighborhood or adversely affect your neighboring properties? No. Would it create lot coverage and setbacks less than the average lot coverage and setback of adjacent properties? No. 
Would it impose a substantial detriment to the public or to immediate neighbors? No. Thank you. Okay. So no one has any questions? No? I just have to ask for butters or interested parties and then we'll vote on it. Okay. Okay. Is there any butters in the audience or interested parties uh, that want to speak to Paul Connolly's uh, petition? Anyone online? If there's anybody online that would like to speak for or against the application, please virtually raise your hand. None noted. Okay, thanks. All right, Paul Connolly is before the board for tax assessor's map. Well, lot 157 seeking a 17.1% lot coverage variance for the purpose of building a porch uh, on their house over what is an existing concrete patio. Mr. Furell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I vote to approve the um, special use permit and dimensional variance. The, the deck is small. It, it is a common accessory use in the neighborhood. The deck fits within the square footprint of the house and doesn't encroach on um, lot lines any further than the house already does. Uh, the lot or the deck actually adds only 3% lot coverage compared to what already exists. And it will allow the applicant full use and enjoyment of their property. To deny this request would amount to more than a mere inconvenience. Thank you, so you approve both. Yes. Right, thank you, Mr. Raposo. I also vote to approve both uh, special use and dimensional variants for reasons stated by uh, Mr. Fierro. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Horowitz? I vote to approve both for reasons previously stated. Thank you. Mr. Donovan? Yes, I also vote to approve the uh, special use and the dimensional variants for the reasons stated by Mr. Fierro. Thank you. The chairman also votes to approve for reasons previously stated by Mr. Fierro as well. So you're all set. Thank you. You're all welcome. Have a great evening. Okay, moving right on. Next item on the agenda is the petition by Eugene and Linda Salvatore for tax assessors map two, lot 37, um, seeking to construct a single family summer cottage. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chair, Gerard Galvin, Galvin Law, Newport, Rhode Island. I represent uh, Jean and Linda Salvatore, who own 1156 Anthony Road. <clears throat> uh, they purchased this home in 2020, and they intended to renovate it much earlier than now. Uh, when they began to uh, seek permission to repair the seawall behind their home, they made a startling discovery, and that was that the uh, property line of record uh, actually went through the structure of, of their mm -hmm. house. And so their efforts at improving the house have been delayed while we've gone to Superior Court and, and cleared that title. Uh, we've accomplished that, and uh, we're beginning the process of uh, seeking to uh, improve the property. <clears throat> so uh, the hardship here, the lots in this area are required to have 10,000 square feet. This lot has now has 5,365 square feet. It's approximately half the size of a conforming lot. Uh, the Salvatores have taken uh, account of the style of home and uh, size of average homes in the neighborhood in coming up with the design that we presented to you tonight. Uh, so this proposal calls for uh, demolishing the existing structure and replacing it. Uh, the replacement approach allows uh, the Salvatores to actually improve on the existing setback encroachments on the property. Um, and I did want to make one slight um, Scriv uh, correction to a Scrivener's error on the front page of the application. It says the existing lot coverage is 1,066 square feet. It's actually 966 square feet. The percentage of lot coverage is accurate. Uh, just a, a slight error there. Didn't impact any notice or the relief we're seeking tonight. So tonight I have uh, Mr. Salvatore here. I have Louis DiBerardino, the architect here, and also Jim Houle, uh, who will testify to the criteria, although he did submit his report in advance and I'll be asking to make that a full exhibit. Okay, we already have it in the package, so. Okay. It's part of it already. Very good. Okay. 
Okay, uh, unless there's any preliminary questions for me, I'll ask Mr. Salvatore to uh, come to the stand. Please, Mr. Man. Sure. Good Salvatore. evening, Gene Salvatore. Oh. It's right here. Swear to tell the truth? Yes. Okay, full name and address for Heather Eugene Boyd. R. Salvatore Jr., uh, 1156 Anthony Road, Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And Mr. Salvatore, what do you do for a living? A uh, builder, contractor. Okay. And you purchased this property at 1156 in 2020, correct? Correct. And soon after that purchase, you became aware of this property line issue. Is that fair to say? Yes. And you've corrected that and you have clear title all the way to the seawall, correct? Correct. Can you describe the existing structure that's on the property briefly? It's substandard. And as far as livable, there's some deflection, serious deflection going on inside the house. And I explored the possibility of remediating what was existing, but by the time I got through with the pricing of it, it was going to be beyond the FEMA criterion, which is 50% of the home value. So that's when I started to explore the possibility of bringing it up to the uh, BFE or base flood elevation criteria. And you've uh, discussed your uh, decision to to renovate and build a new structure with your neighbors, correct? Well, I've let them know what we're trying to do. Okay. It's been quite a process trying to first get title to the property. So. And uh, until yesterday, you hadn't heard any objection from any neighbors, correct? Correct. Uh, and we did receive a letter yesterday that expressed some concern about stormwater. Is that accurate? Correct, yes. Okay. Now, I just want to ask you, in your years living... Um, or owning this property. Have you had any stormwater issues uh, in front of this property? No. Okay. And we'll have uh, the architect speak to some of the steps you're taking to, to uh, improve any stormwater runoff issues, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, can you also just describe for the board uh, your effort to, to keep this new design as minimal as possible? Uh, and make it as small as you could to meet your needs in the area. Well, because it's a substandard lot, we had a lot of criterion that we had to meet. Uh, first of all, with the DEM and the uh, septic. So that sort of gave us the criterion or the, the boundaries by which we could improve. We kept it as small as possible and, and actually made it more, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, more conforming? Yeah, more conforming to the uh, the lot setbacks. Okay. Uh, and in your uh, your opinion, this is the least relief you need uh, to have you know meaningful use of the residential use there, correct? Right. Yeah. It, it, yes, it's one of the smaller houses, even the new with the new structure on the uh, street. Okay. Um, that's all I have on direct for. Uh, Mr. Salvatore, if there's any questions for him, please uh, please ask. And otherwise, I'll move on to Mr. DiBerardino, the architect. Uh, I I can hold. Do uh, you guys have any questions? I've probably got some for the architect, but okay, I can make that. Yeah. Right, you almost said you Thanks. never seen them. Uh, then I'll call Louis DiBerardino to the stand. <clears throat> and Louis, could you just uh, I raise your right hand, identify yeah. yourself, tell the truth. I will, yes. Full name and address for Heather. Uh, Louis DeBerardino, 59 Grove Street, New Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, Grove Street. Uh, so, Louis, you uh, just gave a Connecticut address, and that's where your business is located, correct? Correct. But you are a Rhode Island licensed architect, correct? That's correct. Uh, and you were retained by Gene to design this proposed home, correct? Yes. Can you uh, walk the board briefly through your design process and you know sort of point out your efforts to improve uh, the lot configuration and improve on the setback encroachments? Sure. Uh, both you and Gene mentioned some of those things. We've we've tried to put the house kind of right where it is currently, and we've actually held it tight to both the site, uh, the south rather, and the east setbacks. And by virtue of doing that, we've eliminated most of the encroachment of the current house. Um, it, the footprint is bigger. It's about five feet further to the north from where the current house is. And we've kept it as a simple rectangular shape, again, trying not to make it sort of meander on the property as a way to reduce its footprint or imprint on the property. 
And on the west side setback, which is uh, you know facing facing the water, uh, that is where we are still seeking dimensional relief because we're within the setback, but we're improving on what exists currently. Correct. Yeah, the, the current house, its encroachment, we've reduced that by about half in the current the, the proposed scheme, rather. All right. Now, uh, in your opinion, in your professional opinion, does a lot size of 5,300 square feet in a zone that requires 10,000 square feet of hardship? Certainly, yes. Uh, now, in preparing this design, um, is there any element of the design that you believe will have an adverse impact on any of the neighbors or surrounding area? No, no. Right. Now, we did receive this letter yesterday that asked a question about uh, any stormwater issues. Can you describe um, how this proposal will improve on existing conditions down there? Sure. Uh, actually, part of the application packet includes a, a DEM approved site plan for the property. So it has the septic system shown as well as a vegetated swale to collect all of our roof drainage. The current house does not have gutters, so it, it just kind of spills onto the property. Is this otherwise known as a rain garden? Yeah, essentially, correct, right. So we're, we're taking all of our roof water, all of our impervious area and sending it to that vegetated swale, whereas the current house does not. And, and so I think we're, we're, we're mitigating any concern in my mind. All right. Now, <clears throat> you are well aware of uh, the restrictions in this zone and you did your best to conform to those. Is there any way to uh, reasonably design an alternative uh, to this approach uh, that would allow them, you know, a modern home on their property? We really struggled with the limitations of the site. And obviously it's an undersized lot. And so the setbacks are even sort of tighter to, to where you can build in sort of in a, 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 a certain way. Also, we have, um, I'm trying to think of what else we had there. Um, so it's really mostly setbacks and, and those small, small site I have one other note I want to share. Oh, the septic system and the drainage swells. So the drainage swell is new. And so those two elements are also taking up a lot of the property. So we really were kind of left with a very small area to build in and we've kept it to a, what I think is a modest footprint. And does this design, in your opinion, change the character of the neighborhood in any way? No, we've spent some time looking at the neighborhood and certainly the, what we're proposing from a, both from a size design, it really, there's a lot of examples that are very similar to what we're proposing. So it, I don't think so. Okay. And uh, does this proposal provide for adequate fire protection? Yes. And does it provide for adequate light between buildings? Yes. That's all I have for okay. the architect. Um, What's the overall height? It's a uh, measured from the base flood elevation. It's thirty-one three. Measured from the slab. It's a uh, thirty-nine three, thirty-nine feet three inches. So, yeah, Mr. Chairman, within the package there was a FEMA uh, yeah. uh, certificate which establishes the base flood elevation of uh, fourteen feet. So, I have a question for the solicitor. But do they need a variance to go over the 35 feet? That's in the we, we, I, I understand. I understand. Right. But our ordinance says 35 feet. Yeah. So that's the question. But the, what they're saying is from the flood point elevation, they're measuring up. So overall, it's going to be 39 feet high. I would have to review that. I, you know, I can I can represent that certainly we deal with this in, in Newport all the time. I believe the state law actually establishes that, you know, uh, or federal law, frankly, means we we you you start the measurement of height from the base flood elevation determination. And that's why you'll see the living space on, on this unit right. starts at 14 oh, yeah. feet. We can't have anything underneath that. Uh, and so the height restrictions of the town don't start until we can uh, have that. Okay. Bottom so floor is 9.9 feet. From my experience with Portsmouth, that's also up to interpretation by the building 
Inspector. Oh, inspector. Okay, I'll go with That's that. That's how I, in my situation. Just want to make sure. I would okay. I would agree with that. Okay, thanks, Lee. Okay. I don't have any other questions from the board for the architect. Sue, anything for the architect? No. Nope. <laughs> Okay, then, uh, then I'll call Mr. Hool to the stuff sure. very briefly. <clears throat> now, uh, we did submit Mr. Hool's report last week, and I know it's part of the package. Um, if anybody needs a hard copy tonight, um, I have them, if anybody would like one. Um, otherwise, and perhaps, Mr. Hool, you could identify yourself no. and be sworn in. So want to tell the truth? I do. Full name and address for Heather, please. James Hool, H O U L E, one ninety eight Union Street, Portsmouth. Yep. Uh, and Mr. Hool has been recognized as an expert in land use many times. Yep. I ask that he be so recognized tonight. And I have a motion to uh, recognize Mr. Hool as an expert in real estate. So moved. Could I have a second? Second. Uh, motion has been made and second to uh, recognize Mr. James Hool as an expert in real estate. All in favor? I opposed. Okay. And it, it may be redundant, but if I could just, for the record, um, ask that his report be recognized as a full exhibit. Yeah, I mean, it's already in the packet that's been presented, okay. so it is part of the record already. Okay, very good. I, I think with it being done, uh, it, it it may minimize how much we have to walk through in testimony. Um, Mr. Bull certainly walks through every criteria um, uh, that the town requires for this relief. So perhaps we'll uh, summarize. Yeah, we'll, we'll let him summarize it and open it up to any questions that you might have. Right. I mean, I think the um, the two critical issues um, is really the hardship involved here being the size of a lot. Um, I think the huh. um, petitioner has done a great job of trying to move the building back in uh, to within the buildable area of the lot. The only encroachment outside of the buildable area is the um, uh, stairs going down. Uh, the lot coverage uh, clearly is an issue. I did survey eight of the neighboring lots. It's very tight down there. Um, I found the average uh, lot coverage was 27.29. Uh, um, and we're requesting a 26.4. So it's clearly very much in harmony with the neighborhood. Um, I, I really, you know, I think that those two issues, the fact that this is the hardship is the fact that it's a substandard lot. Um, and the, and the fact that the lot coverage being requested is, um, within the neighborhood is really the two critical issues. Okay. Thank you. Questions to Mr. Hull at all? Thank you, Mr. Gavin. Uh, Mr. Knott, that's it. That's, that's it. all we have. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody have any other questions for the applicant before ask for butters? No. Nope. Any of butters or interested parties to the Eugene Salvatore petition? <clears throat> yes, sir. Raise your right hands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, tell the truth. Grab your name and address, please. Mr. For... Chris Thompson, T H O M P S O N. I live at 1155 Anthony Road, or um, 02871. Anthony Road. What was your address, Mr. Thompson? 1155 Anthony Road. Thank you. So we are in the house to the east of the okay. house we're talking about. Is the, is, the, is the green light on on the microphone there? Yes. Okay. Do, you me, do you want me to talk closer? Yeah, that would help. Here. I think that moves a little closer. Stop talking. Well, this is the closest I can get without actually putting it in my mouth. Um, so the very first book I read when I did my master's in city planning course was a book called The Zoning Game by Thomas Babcock. And he makes the comment in there that the zoning game consists of neighbors competing for property value using zoning. And I think if that's the case, that's very unfortunate because we've actually enjoyed getting to know Dina and... Uh... Yeah, <laughs> hang on a second. Wait, I'm gonna check that. Is the radiator over here? <laughs> Oh, 
tying up. No, 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 that's okay. If it's going to be an issue. The other mics we can put on. If I talk at this volume, can you all hear me in the screen? Yes, but you're up to this. Well, I can hear it on this. <laughs>
Test, test. I got it, Heather. Got it. Test, test. Can you hear it? Yeah, don't touch that. Yeah. The zoning board of review is back in session. Didn't know that was on my job description. Yeah, it's working now. Thank welcome. you for your patience. Okay, we. Wow. Why? That one works. Hello. They work. That, that works. I just fixed it. Test, test, one, two, three, test. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it goes. <laughs> When she unplugged this, plus the wire, there's a break in that wire. So I want to And it's making contact. As long as nobody moves it. God. Oh. Yeah. You guys want to turn your mics back on. So your red butt lights on, you shouldn't be. There you go. There we go. All right. Zoning Board of Review is back in session. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Go ahead. My name is Chris. Thompson, T H O M P S O N. I live at 1155 Anthony Road, Portsmouth 02871. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. As I was starting to say, um, the first book I ever read in my Masters of City Planning course is a book called The Zoning Game by Thomas Babcock. And he has a fairly scathing idea of what zoning does, including pitting neighbors against neighbors in pursuit of property value. I think that's sad because we've actually liked getting to know Dina and her, her dog Maverick, and we, we hope her family will be there for years to come and we can all be good neighbors. We can be good, good friends after this. But when we bought our house at 1155, our realtor was at pains to explain to us all the zoning rules that we, we would have to live under. We accepted that. And that was all capitalized into the price of the house we paid. Presumably, the rules that affected uh, Mr. Salvatore's purchase um, were also capitalized into the price he paid. So I would just ask, if you're going to allow variance to those, um, have it be for a substantial reason, number one, and have it be the least relief possible. So in other words, if it's presently a one-bedroom house or a two-bedroom house, let the replacement be a one-bedroom or a two-bedroom house. Um, otherwise, I think we're calling, calling a mockery on the zoning regime. So have it be a substantial reason for uh, the change and have it be the least variance that will allow that substantial reason to be fulfilled. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Lee, is there anyone on? If there's anybody online that would like to speak virtually, raise your hand so we can elevate you. Unnoted. I'm Pat Shablum, 1155 Anthony Mode as well. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the fact that you took into account the drainage, but the drainage that we I'm concerned about is in front of the property on the road. Three houses down, we have Lake Anthony on Anthony Road. Yeah. 
Now I know Lake Anthony. We have a smaller lake, Pond Anthony, in front of this property right. when it rains. Okay. So your, I like the, the water garden idea, but it won't handle the water. Ponding on the road, though, mm -hmm. is a town issue then. Okay. It's a town drainage issue. There's nothing we can do about that. Well, I just ask, oh, yeah, as you absolutely. make the design, can you drain the water? Because it's in front of your property, and so it'll impact the property. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's worth asking. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, Eugene and Linda Salvatore before the board for tax assessors map two, lot 37, seeking a six foot rear yard setback variance for the purpose of the ingress egress stairs from their deck, a 6.4% lot coverage variance, and a special use permit for a substandard lot of record of which the applicant has given testimony to that. Mr. Furell. Mr. Chairman, um, I vote to approve the dimensional variance. I consider there being two hardships at play here. The first being the existing home requires substantial renovation and, and you know, pushing it into, as Mr. Salvatore noted, into an area where, where other agencies would not allow the rebuild. And the fact that this is a substandard lot. And <clears throat> frankly, I commend the builder for, for designing a home that is within the setbacks on three sides, improving the condition on the lot and only requiring that six foot blip on the steps, which, which not only is reasonable to provide ingress and egress to the property, but also faces away from the street and other abutters. I also vote to approve the special use permit as, uh, as testified to the criteria for the special use permit is met and this is the least relief necessary and to deny this request would amount to more than a mere inconvenience. And the lot coverage variance? Oh, I also vote to approve the lot covered variance because this is a, sub, a substandard lot and virtually any build on this lot would require some kind of variance and the 6% um, lot cover variance is small. Thank you, Mr. Raposa. I also think it's the uh, least relief necessary and vote to approve the dimensional, the uh, lot coverage and the special, special use permit. Thank you. Ms. Horowitz. I vote to approve all um, variances and special use permit. What I would say to the gentleman who spoke, I don't think it's an unreasonably sized house. Um, it's two and a half bedrooms. That's not unreasonable by today's standards and with the cost of property. So I think it's, it's not it's not unless it's not extra large. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Donovan. I also vote to approve the variance that's been previous, previously stated. And the special use permit. And special well, yes, that oh, thank you. Chair, chairman also votes to approve for reasons previously stated by uh, Mr. Furell, both the dimensional variance, lot coverage variance, and the special use permit. So it's been approved. Okay. You're all set. everything out of the way. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the petition of AP Enterprises LLC for properties located at Zero Walnut, Zero Highland, Zero Russell Avenue, being tax assessors map. 20 lots, one, three, 13, and map 25 lot two, uh, zone commercial and residential. Before we get started, a couple things. First of all, the board only meets till 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, we're done, okay? So if we haven't gotten through everything, it will get continued. Number two, there are people in this room that are for this. There are people in this room that are opposed to this. We all know that. We've been through these before. What I'm asking is for everyone to be kind and considerate when someone is speaking and try to keep your comments to yourself. Everyone that wants to speak 
will get the opportunity to speak. And allowing them to speak freely and being opposed to a war is what makes this country without people getting all upset. So if we can all just keep civil through all this, I would greatly appreciate it. It will make our job easier, okay? So thank you. We'll probably take a break about 8.30 for a couple of minutes. So if everybody's got to stretch their legs and so on. So without further, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman, members of the board. My name is Jennifer Cervenka um, of Cervenka Green and Ducharme LLC. Yeah, C-E-R, V as in Victor, E-N-K-A. We're located at 225 Dyer Street, second floor, Providence, 02903. I'm here tonight on behalf of AP Enterprises, LLC, on its special use permit application for Island Oasis, an outdoor recreational facility that will consist of 13 beach volleyball courts, allowing for conversion to some secondary beach recreational uses, uh, if that uh, presents itself, three temporary trailers, an access road and associated parking. The site is located in the Southern portion of the former landfill in Island Park, which over the last 20 years, my client has spent cleaning up. As the capping is nearly complete, he is now seeking to bring this property back into productive use. This board here tonight is charged with evaluating the proposed project against criteria laid out in your zoning ordinance, which largely focuses on how a project fits into a community. And as you will hear tonight, and as you see in the application materials, we indeed fit into this community. First, the project aligns with the town's 2022 comprehensive plan, which provides as an action item, and I quote, pursue opportunities to establish active and passive recreational facilities accessible to all neighborhoods. As noted in the plan, there is a deficit in volleyball courts in the town. It also aligns with the town's completed parks, recreation, and open space master plan, which recognizes the need for more recreational resources over the next decade. And it recognizes that there is a demand specifically for outdoor recreational resources and recommends the development of new outdoor facilities. As noted by the assistant town planner in his staff report, this is one of the least intensive uses to which this property could be put. It will have 13 courts, which under normal operating conditions will have four people per court. It will operate only during daylight hours and only seasonally from late spring until early fall. There will be no lighting, no speakers, uh, no amplified music. As you will hear from our traffic expert, it will not generate a significant increase in traffic on Park Avenue. The entrance will have more than adequate sight distances. Given the amount of trips of the facility will normally generate during peak hours, that is, and you'll hear from our traffic expert, 40 to 50 cars, the 100 parking spaces that are proposed for this is more than adequate. Under the town's closest use for calculating parking, uh, which is tennis, pointed out by your assistant planner, the required parking would be 39 spaces for those 13 courts. We are 61 spaces above that number. The facility will be set back from the bordering residential properties by significant distances, vastly exceeding both residential and commercial setback requirements. Natural buffering will exist between the residences to the east uh, by nature of existing vegetation and a berm. This is a landfill built up. 
there's going, there is an existing perimeter fence and there will be installed a security fence around the courts that will prevent trespassing onto abutting properties. The security fence will have minimally on the residential sign, a green windscreen, which is installed that will provide further privacy to those residential properties. Is that shown on the plans anywhere? It's shown on the renderings, which we will discuss uh, when we get to our architectural expert. But it's nothing that's been provided to the board. It's nothing that's been provided to the board. We have decided that we want to offer that. There will be no permanent structures, no impervious surfaces that will generate additional stormwater runoff. Finally, it'll be located in an area that is already a mixture of residential, commercial, uh, and recreational. And across from the beach, which has both active and recreational activities, and it's on the outer edge of Island Park, allowing for quick in and out of the island. Also, I'd like to point out, um, as uh, was flagged in your staff report, all environmental concerns related to locating this facility, uh, whether it's the soil used, the protectiveness of the cap, uh, any dust that might be generated um, by the construction or during operation, that is all subject to permitting before the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. In addition, there will be additional permitting that will be required before the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council. And that is geared towards the protection of the coastal resources that abut on the uh, Western side. And there will also be permitting by the Rhode Island Department of Transportation via the access, uh, uh, the existing curb cut off of Park Avenue. So any approval here tonight can certainly be conditioned upon us receiving those state approvals, but the board should be cognizant that its decision-making should not displace what is within the jurisdiction of those state bodies. Finally, I wanna emphasize that we are not seeking as part of this application approval to operate large tournaments with a PA system, and music that drives in hordes of people and cars. Our normal operating condition that we're planning that is set forth in the operational plan that we provided would be two by two recreational beach volleyball across 13 courts with the potential secondary uses, also sand related, soccer, tennis, strength conditioning. Yes, so chairman. Let me reiterate, I'm going because I don't want you to get ahead of us. Okay. I'm looking at your revised operational plan. Yes. The revised operational plan says two teams of two players or for some tournaments, two teams of four players. And we- Is it two or is it four? The normal operating condition will be two or four per- You just said two before. Now yeah. you're changing- I, I'm to sorry, two. two by two. So four total per court normal operating condition. No, this says two teams of four players, that's eight. Yes, so if, and we will address that as to the tournaments. Uh, AP Enterprise does not plan itself to operate tournaments at the facility. Because um, I have a, I, I personally have a number of other questions regarding this, but yes. also for clarification, you're saying the proposal is for 13 volleyball courts, correct? Correct. Or is it 13 volleyball courts and a soccer court? It's 13 volleyball courts if there is a converted. All right. I into, got, I, so, uh, so let me let me explain. Hang, hang, hang on. Hang on. Okay. I'm going by the material we have. Yeah. Your drawing, your submittal. Yes. I count 13 courts. Yeah. And a soccer court. You're you're correct on our so, original so, site plan. Now you can tell me there's a different site plan? Yes. No. Do we have it? This is this is absolutely absurd. You expect us. You're now talking about giving us different material and so on, stuff we haven't had an opportunity to review. 
and you're going to give it to us tonight and you're going to ask for a decision we provided it this afternoon and it's this afternoon this afternoon wait a minute you excuse me this is the third month the third month you asked for one continuance to another continuance to tonight and now you're saying hey we just brought it in this afternoon that's completely disrespectful to this board totally i i apologize it was a an right oversight now, i'm going by what we have not what you've changed it to well we have copies paper copies of that the only thing that has changed on that site plan it's the only thing is that it depicts 13 volleyball courts period as opposed to 13 volleyball courts plus a soccer facility or soccer field may i ask a question please do does the uh traffic plan also require excuse me could you please keep it down does the traffic plan also require amending because i believe it also had tables showing um something different it was 13 inclusive of the soccer field that's mm -hmm. we recognize that by looking at that that traffic study that we had not presented it in the original plan as being 13 inclusive that's what drove it so now all our materials are consistent across the board, 13 beach volleyball courts, unless one of them or three of them get converted to a soccer court because it takes three beach volleyball courts to make one soccer court. So wow. you'll see in the traffic study when we get to it, that there is a table which shows those two alternatives. One so is 13 beach volleyball courts, one is 10, plus the soccer field. That's, that's not what the traffic report said. It does. No, it doesn't. It says a pr proposed facility would provide one beach soccer pit, which would be in place of three volleyball courts. Part of that, it says there's going to be 13 beach volleyball courts. And I got that high line because I'm saying, well, that's not what the plan shows. So now we go back to the plan that you say is incorrect. Uh, so we have a revised plan that is consistent with our traffic study report. So what this appears to me to be is some sort of fluid petition as we move along here things are changing and i don't understand that and yeah. i've been doing this now 20 some odd years and i don't think i've ever started one in all those years that has been this fluid this big a controversial petition that people have not crossed the t's dotted the i's and said let's make sure they have everything they need prior to continue on okay um you know i believe we'll be able to address that and provide the materials that you need to understand uh what we're proposing again uh, the only change is to depict 13 volleyball courts uh and and have that number consistent with our traffic study you at one point will someone will get up to speak as to the actual operation of it correct i'm sorry we'll get up to speed as to the actual, actual operation. operation in other words so you talk 13 you're talking 13 courts unless right. one is or three are converted for soccer right. but also these courts can be rented by people from the outside correct they can yes right so there's nothing to preclude some corporation that wants to have a team building things come in and say we want to rent 10 13 courts we're going to play six on six correct uh so in that circumstance when there's a tournament situation those tournament organizers where you'd bring in a significant amount of people would then have to seek an outdoor entertainment license no actually you'd probably have to seek an amendment to the special use permit well i the the town council has the purview for if we place conditions yeah. on it then you would have to come back here but my yeah, point, and my point is that. this, my point is we're not talking a 500 person event. We're talking more than what is being depicted because someone could rent it and go six. And now all of a sudden, if 12 or you know 24 people want to rent two courts, it's going to put you over what you say it's going to operate at. So there's a way to address that through conditions and a special use permit. Right, but then there's also the part of trying to enforce that but go ahead 
Okay. I, right now, it's about as clear as mud. So. Okay, so I, I'm going to conclude my introductory remarks so we can just get into yes. the witness testimony. Sure. Um, and I just want to identify first my six witnesses in the order in which they will speak. Uh, the first will be Art Palmer, um, who is the principal of AP Enterprises. Uh, Art will talk about the beach volleyball sport, his objectives with the facility, uh, and his investment in the community. Uh, second up, we'll have Timothy O'Connor, um, who's our professional engineer overseeing the closure of the landfill. Uh, and he will talk about the regulatory process with RIDEM, uh, being Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, compliance, and the future permitting uh, with RIDEM for this project. Uh, next, Adi Osgood, um, who's our civil engineer and project manager. He will walk the board through our revised site plan where the facility will be located on the property, the setbacks, materials used, fencing, and the like. Uh, fourth, Melissa Hutchinson, who's our architect, and she will talk about how the facility will look. Uh, she will speak to several uh, visual renderings that we've provided uh, for demonstrative purposes. Todd Brayton, um, who's our traffic engineer, and he will talk about his findings and conclusions uh, in his traffic report. And finally, Tom Sweeney, our real estate expert, who will talk about his findings and conclusions in his report. You have both Mr. Brayton's and Mr. Sweeney's reports uh, in your packet. Um, so with that, um, I would like to call up um, Mr. Palmer, uh, to address the items that I just mentioned. Hang on a second. Just a second. Yeah. Go ahead. This thing's the planning part, talk about some of the proposals and certain things, delicate operations. Is it just that now? Or is that I think that, um, well, you can ask the question whether she wants to address it now or later. Um, I'm concerned about the hours of operation being 7 a.m. to uh, 8 p.m. Obviously, times there aren't many times of the year where you'll be doing it as late as 8 p.m. 7 a.m. is is early for uh, a neighborhood, and I know that there will be cars coming early. When I do have done athletic things in the past, I'm never arriving at the time the matches are starting. I'm arriving half an hour early, warming up and things like that. So, um, if this were to be approved, I would want to see that a starting time much later than that, probably 8:30, 9 o'clock, to uh, uh, to allow because a lot of this is going to be on weekends too. So people. You know, want to rest or you know do whatever. I think it's going to be, you know, at, just too early to start it at seven o'clock. I understand, and we're amenable, you know, to um, reasonable restrictions on hours. Thank you. Raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth. You. Full name and address for Heather, please. Arthur Palmer. Resides at 2018. I got it. Don't worry. 28 Teal Drive, Wakefield, Rhode Island. 02879. Mr. Palmer, you want to pull the microphone up so you speak into it, please? How's that? Is that better? <laughs> might have to move it down a little so it's closer to you. How's that? Is that better? That's better. Okay. Uh, okay. I apologize for a few slip ups on the. You'll have to speak up a little bit too, because even with the mic, it's difficult. <laughs> I apologize for the few mix ups with the plans. Um, we were trying to be as thorough as possible and we, um, we went through a final review um, yesterday and realized we had that issue that you described. So I apologize for the inconvenience and the late notice on that. Um, but anyways, after 30, 30 plus years getting to this point, I'm extremely excited to be here to finally get the project off the ground. It's been a long journey to clean up the site and put, the, and put it back into productive use. With your approval tonight, the town will receive a capped landfill to no expense to the town 
the community will now have a new recreational facility to be included in the town's recreation portfolio. In order to understand my dream and my mission of this facility, you first need to understand what beach volleyball actually is. Beach volleyball is more than a sport. It's a lifestyle, collective yet personal. It's how we engage in fun, active, competitive outdoor world. The beach lifestyle is the catalyst and main attraction to the sport. Beach volleyball as a, as a lifestyle sport, players learn to live, appreciate a more relaxed, responsible lifestyle, which includes being overly healthy and in fit individuals, able to take their skills learned and play the game for the rest of the year. The concept of the Island Park Oasis came to me in the 1980s, uh, midway through my tenure of operating the Newport Volleyball Club based in Newport. With many trips to the East Coast, I realized that the beach lifestyle here on Aquidneck Island is not the experience I wanted to offer my members. Everything beach volleyball related is either organized and scheduled. Playing in cold, rainy, and damp conditions, and in some cases, even have to set up the nets in order to play. As of, as of the, the 2015 sale of the Atlantic Beach Club in Middletown, there's no longer a play to, place to play casual pickup games in a social uh, atmosphere. I had to have a location with a vista overlooking the water to give me the look and feel of a beach. Thus the location associated with, with the permit request, providing a fabulous view of the Sakonet and the Atlantic Ocean and with beach goers across the street enjoying the same things that, are, that the beach has to offer. This venue is to provide this healthy lifestyle that I envision for the beach volleyball and Island Park community. The beach game requires all skills of the sport while the indoor game is more specialized. Just think of the versatility of the boys and not, I mean the girls and now boys high school volleyball teams versatility available to their coaches. Hopefully Portsmouth High School will become a volleyball powerhouse in Rhode Island. This facility will, will foster the development of beach volleyball community on and off the beach. The, IP, the IPO facility will offer the ability to grow the sport, bringing a fun and excitement of beach volleyball in a very relaxing and hassle-free environment, removing the attendance required for legal uh, for leagues and tournaments. I'm leaving those programs up to the established volleyball clubs in the region. This facility is designed to complement those programs. The reason I mentioned leagues and tournaments in my ops plan, as you said, Mr. Chairman, full transparency that if an outside club or organization wished to rent the facility to host such an event. I have no plans to integrate any leagues or tournaments into my scheduling or accept any outside renters for the first one to two years or until I am satisfied that my business model is running smooth and any issues are addressed and corrected. This facility will rely on the strength of the beach volleyball community and striving to create a close-knit group of beach volleyball players and families as a foundation success of this facility. As for me, I am not a developer. I was just a guy in my 30s that started this venture, and now I'm in my 60s. <clears throat> With both knee and shoulder surgery, my competitive days are over. I would like to play beach volleyball recreationally and get my family and the next generation involved in the sport that I love. I do have extensive experience in sports management, organizing, facilitating sports programs, as a former tennis teacher professional at the Tennis Hall of Fame in Newport and the operator of the Newport Volleyball Club in both tennis and volleyball, I oversaw day-to-day -day operations, numerous leagues and events. As a former resident of Newport, living off a of lower Thames Street for 35 years, I totally can relate to the impact of development on traffic and noise. As development started to creep down towards my house with additional restaurants and outdoor entertainment to 1 a.m. in the early 90s, my quality of life was rapidly deteriorating, lack of sleep, and the ability to get home from work and parking. 
I don't wish that upon anybody and want to have the lines of communications open to address reasonable concerns going forward. The good, about, the good part about sand is that it has a sound deafening quality to it. <clears throat> when I was in charge of a Newport Volleyball Club, I had a long standing track record of being respectful and without incident in terms of nuisances adjacent to the neighborhoods, as well as a solid rapport with the beach management. This facility will be no different. As you will hear from the experts, I hope you agree with me that this project um, for the town of Pro for the town of Portsmouth that warrants the approval of the special use permit. Thank you for your consideration. So, Mr. Palmer, I have a couple questions. First of all, I'll give you a little of my background. Okay, I played thirty years. I was only a B-rated player. Okay, I never you know. So, and like you, I've had my share of surgeries too. Okay. <laughs> Uh, first of all, there's a lot of misnomer out there when people say beach volleyball, but it's not on the beach. But any anytime volleyball is played on the sand, people say it's beach volleyball. It's just because that's where it started. Correct. correct. Okay. Um, I did have the opportunity years ago to play over in Narragansett, never Newport. So in terms of the operation of it, mm -hmm. you build the facility. Will there be league play there like in Newport or Narragansett? No. Then how will the courts operate if there's not a league to come in or play or things like that? So the um, the memberships, well, they're not memberships, they're actually passes, which you can rent by the hour, um, by the day, by the week, by the month, or seasonally for the whole season. Um, when we were uh, back in those 30s, we used to play, uh, um, they used to allow us to set up courts at um, uh, Middletown Second Beach. Yep. And we used to play what we called challenge courts, where you win, you stay, you lose, you go down, and you would go to the beach and all these all the players would be there and you just kind of enjoy yourself. So if you bought a season, if you bought a seasonal pass, you could get four of your friends, take a court and use it. All right. So that brings me up to my question previously. So if five of us, which I doubt we would do. <laughs> purchase passes we go down and there's mm -hmm. other people there mm -hmm. we could say hey let's play yeah correct absolutely but could we play five on five no why not because it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be attractive to anybody else that's there there ain't going to be five people out to play against you well no no one would want to play against <laughs> us, trust me <laughs> no but my point is is how do you regulate it so there's no more than say four on a side. I mean, if I'm renting a pass, yep. what restricts me from I can only play 4v4 or 2v2? I mean, I'm renting a pass. Mm -hmm. Why can't I just go do my thing with my friends? That's true. Right? That's true. But, you know, the, the attraction of that is very minimal in the sport, for one. I, I understand that. On, on the second but part the of that. potential is there. Correct. Okay. All right. You know, answered my question. What, yeah. kind, Go ahead. what kind of supervision is going to be there on a during operating hours? Uh, there'll be management there. Hmm? There'll be management there, overseeing the scheduling and um, and uh, admittance on who should be there and who should not be there. Um, maintaining uh, law and order, as I say. Um, there will also be a, uh, a attendant will be responsible for equipment repairs or anything else that kind of goes down, making sure the restroom stay clean, this, that, and the other. Um, that's So what would be the number of on-site staff on a daily basis? How many people? Basically just two. Just two. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Palmer. Yes. Um, will spectators be allowed on the site? Um, I the, don't. The, the reason I ask is, is, is I uh, years ago I coached kids soccer. Yep. And we often had 
as many parents as we had players. Right. And I believe in your operational plan, you talk about youth organizations coming to help, which implies parents. And, and this question will also come up with the traffic study with, with I don't believe anywhere in, in the documentation, you talk about spectators. And to some extent, this is a spectator sport. Correct. So I'm wondering, could I get in without a pass if I'm but you're not you, well to watch my friends? Um, you can, but you are you're referring to um, the tournaments, though. Uh, no, no, I'm referring so, to. But to, this to, this isn't like that, though. People aren't going to come to be a spectator, which is not. Um, if I may, that's all. I, I beg to differ on that. Just the other night, my son happens to play in a wiffle ball league in town. A league. A leave. Yeah, but it's it's pretty much almost the same thing. It's not. You know what? Families go, kids go to watch their dad hit a wiffle mm -hmm. ball. It's it's you know, but that's what people do. If I go to play volleyball, my wife went to watch me play. The closest I mean, thing I could yeah. position this to is is an open basketball court where some people are playing mm -hmm. and some people are watching. Now they may play later, or they may not play at all. But 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 I think you answered my question that I could get on the site without a pass, provided I don't play. But I can park, okay. and I can bring a cooler because there's no there's no um, water or anything like that, and my cooler can have alcohol in it, and your two employees aren't going to be able to keep track of who's underage or overage. And unlike a municipal operation where you can have a municipal code that says no alcohol and be cited for it, on your private site, if I bring on a, a cooler of Bacardi, um, I'm just going to sit there and quietly get stoned. And and <laughs> your your two your two uh, people are never going to know about it <laughs> until I try to drive out of the site. Yeah. So, but 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 it appears. To me, that that um, um, uh, modeling this after golf, which I think is done in the traffic study, has the flaw that you don't have a crowd of people following the four golfers playing golf, and you don't have people coming on, parents coming on to watch their kid play golf. So, so I'm concerned about the number of people that are going to be on this site, and whether the the traffic. The, the the traffic, I don't want to call it a traffic study analysis. The, the traffic analysis is sufficient because I believe at one point in the traffic analysis, it, it, it bumps up you know, the number of trips or something to 80. And it says, well, if you hit 100, you need a formal traffic study. So we're close to 100. The 80 must have some swing room in it. And we're not considering spectators. So, so uh, the, uh, the, the population that's going to be on site appears to be kind of unbounded. Well, all, all I can say is, is uh, you know, if you were to bring your kids there, I'm sure you would be bringing them and it wouldn't be an additional cost. Most people that go to spectate in beach volleyball will come with the players themselves. That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Palmer, I'm going to refer to um, the document that was provided to us called the Island Park Oasis Beach Volleyball Operational Plan. This is the revised copy. Mm -hmm. It says Be Beach Volleyball Statement by Art Palmer. So if there's something I ask and you say, no, that wasn't me, then that's fine. So under the facility use part, to discuss the 13 sand courts um, and does discuss the multiple secondary uses such as beach soccer, beach tennis, sand strength, et cetera. But it does go on to say that the facility will offer courts by reservation for rent by adult and youth leagues and for the general public. So that contradicts everything I've heard today that there's no leagues yet this document that was provided to us um, by your representative and says it's your statement 
says that. Um, so that brings up one, so and then it goes on to say under expected patrons, the maximum number of patrons expected for tournament play is approximately 95 plus or minus 90 players and five staff. So that's kind of sort of contradictory because in a couple places here, it talks about leagues. So if I wanted, the way I read it is if I wanted to form a volleyball league, Portsmouth, you know, adult over 60 volleyball league, mm -hmm. and I could come down and say, look, we want to rent the courts on Monday nights and uh, it's our league. And according to this, I can do that. But you've given testimony and we heard previously from your representative that there won't be any leagues. Right. If an outside organization chooses to rent it. So I'm not going to engage in any of that policy at this stage. Um, so I, there could be a league play down there then. If an outside group wants to rent it for league play, there would be a league playing, correct? Yep. Which brings me to what Mr. Furell just said. If you have league play, people are going to come and watch. Okay. You, you've answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Kevin, anything? Just, just a comment. Yeah. All that on the uh, cross-sectional plan, there's grass viewing area on each side. Okay. Thank you. Oh, it's also a place to put your gear when you're there. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, it's also a place to put your gear okay. when you're at the facility. Mm -hmm. um, most players will come to a to the beach with a beach chair, you know, or an umbrella, whatever. Yeah. And we kind of set up camp. That's what that's for. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all set. All right. Thank you. I'd like to call now our next witness, which is Timothy O'Connor. Hello. Raise your right hand. Swear to tell the truth. I do. Full name and address for Heather, please. Timothy M. O'Connor, 124 Only Avenue, North Providence, Rhode Island. Thank you. Mr. O'Connor, are you employed? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I am employed as a... Speak into the microphone. Sorry. Now you can pull it down closer to the whole base. It should go down. We're good. Yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, yes, I'm employed on a part time basis. I operate as a sole proprietor. I uh, provide an environmental consultation that's based on my 35 years of experience. That's my part time job. My full time job is director of environmental health and safety for Johnson and Wales University. And Mr. O'Connor, uh, or <laughs> O'Connor, sorry about that. Um, what do you consult on? Uh, hazardous materials and oil. Um, Hazardous materials and oil contaminated properties and rely on the assessment and cleanup of them. And then what do you do as a director of environmental health and safety for Johnson and Wales? Uh, I, I, from a safety standpoint, um, we have uh, 6,000 students, 1,500 employees operating under some degree or another of 15 OSHA standards and manage that. We have um, environmental permits for stormwater, air pollution control, uh, sewer discharge uh, from a waste standpoint, hazardous waste generation at four locations, regulated medical waste at a half dozen locations, um, universal waste, uh, oil uh, debris and whatnot, cleaning up any spills that happen to the above of what I just mentioned, um, noise, mold cleanups, air, um, indoor air quality problems, lead paint, asbestos, uh, we also have 10 uh, DM brownfield sites that have been remediated with deed restrictions on them and manage them as well. Thank you. And prior to becoming a consultant and working for Johnson and Wales, what did you do? Uh, I was a consultant for the uh, Providence firm uh, Banas Hanging in Brooklyn. And and what is um, VHB short? What what is that? Uh, it's a civil engineering firm. I manage the environmental group in the Providence office. Um, and uh, prior to working for VHB, did you do something else? I worked for the Department of, Environment, uh, Department of Environmental Management for 10 years. And what did you do there? 
I worked in the, well, the, the name changed, but the responsibilities really didn't change. I worked for the Division of Air and Hazardous Materials, Division of Site Remediation, and Office of Waste Management. It's essentially all three ended up in um, our, uh, the entity that's currently re regulating the site. There, I managed a, a group of individuals that were charged with regulating the assessment and remediation of hazardous materials and oil contaminated properties. Thank you. And do you hold any professional licenses? Uh, yes, professional, professional engineer in Rhode Island and four other states. Um, and uh, what did you do for your post high school education? I have a bachelor's and master's degree in civil and environmental engineering from URI. Um, I'm handing to you a document, if you can please identify that. Oh, uh, yep, it's a copy of my resume. Um, may I approach for copies for the board? Absolutely. Yep. That way, that way, and actually, if you have one more extra, um, Mr. Gavin. I've already provided. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll mark this as Exhibit 1, which is the uh, resume of Timothy M. O'Connor, professional engineer. And Mr. O'Connor, does uh, this resume set forth the qualifications that you just testified to as far as your work experience, uh, education, and professional licenses? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, at this point, uh, move to have Mr. O'Connor uh, qualified uh, as a Rhode Island licensed professional engineer with expertise in the investigation and remediation of Rhode Island contaminated sites. Sorry. All right. Uh, somebody want to make a motion to accept uh, Mr. O'Connor as a civil engineer with expertise and in environmental um, site remediation? I'll make a motion to accept him as an expert. Could I have a second? Second. Motion been made and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, go back to your uh, days at DEM at, uh, during that period of time, uh, which was approximately a decade. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, did you work on uh, landfill matters? Uh, yes. I mean, there's a, a state of Rhode Island probably has about 50 or 60 landfills that operated before there were environmental permits in place and environmental permitting processes before EPA and before DEM. So a number of sites ended up in um, the site assessment and remediation world, okay, including Portsmouth landfill. And uh, for how long have you worked on the Portsmouth landfill? Uh, since 1999. And that's uh, you started that when you were at VHB, is that correct? Yes. And you've continued working on it uh, into your um, next career as being a private consultant uh, and working for Johnson & Wales. Yes. Okay. Um, and now I'd like to talk with you about the landfill closure process um, for this particular landfill. Um, can you, but as a little bit of a background, can you provide to this board um, that what is the general process for investigating, remediating, closing a landfill, just the overall process? Uh, you, you start with an investigation of the property. Um, using the rules and regulations for the, <clears throat> you, you start with an investigation of the property using the rules and regulations for the investigation and remediation of hazardous material sites. It's a stepwise process uh, per the rules, starts an investigatory process. Next steps, a remedial action work plan. Um, once you're done with the investigation process, um, DM basically issues you a letter that says you've completed the investigation 
proceed to the next step. You would uh, submit a remedial action work plan. Again, they review, comment on it, eventually get your uh, approval. And then when you're done with that, you get a chance to go out and do the work. Uh, when you're all done with the process, you know, you, you may need to file a deed restriction. You may need to do post-closure monitoring. At somewhere in the process, towards the end, you'll file a closure report that'll essentially document that you've done everything that you said you were going to do. And so far, has the process that you've just described been the process for the Portsmouth, the former Portsmouth landfill? Yes, it has. Um, we've done the, the investigatory process was a two-step process. We submitted a report to DEM. We got comments on it. We went back out, did a little bit more work, submitted that, and got our remedial approval letter. Uh, after that, um, we so let me let me oh, stop sorry. you there um, and ask you. Uh, what is the approved remedy for this landfill? It is uh, the use of shaping and grading soils that gives, when, um, when we started the investigatory process, the landfill, the landfill was flat. It had uh, soil exceedances on the surface, waste on the surface. It was thickly vegetated. It was essentially a hole filled with waste. Um, what we proposed was to use shaping and grading soils to sort of provide a sort of a mounding effect or more of a traditional sort of landfill look to the site and then add two feet of clean soil that uh, meets the DEM residential standards on top of that. Okay, and as part of this remedy, um, the uh, AP Enterprise uh, applied for and received what's called a beneficial uh, use determination, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, and can you explain to the board what a bud that's short is so uh the bud is a regulatory tool that allowed us to use that shaping and grading soil so if you can again go back to what i just said about the site you know we had um industrial commercial soil exceedances on the surface waste on the surface we put these uh soils that um otherwise you know, what we're calling shaping and grading soils um these are soils that are above a residential standard, but below an industrial commercial standard. So they're, they're better than the soils that's on the surface of a site already. Um, but under other regulatory circumstances, someone that had these soils may end up having to like, dispose of them. So DEM provides this regulatory policy where you can take soils that maybe aren't completely clean or above residential standards um, and, and use them for an engineered purpose. And there's been some discussion and objection letters about arsenic in the soils. Um, can you address that in the bud materials? Uh, yep. So when we received our remedial action work plan approval, so approval of the remedy for the two feet of clean soil on top of everything and the shaping and grading soils, we also received appro approval for this, this bud. Um, that was specific to the shaping and grading soils and gave us that regulatory um, permission. Um, Sorry, I lost the, that. Um, just, I, I oh, yeah, the arsenic, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's a little complicated. So uh, for the arsenic, what we found when we started taking soil in to build our cap on our landfill was something, ar arsenic is a very frustrating substance when it comes to um, work that I do. It's a hazardous substance, but it occurs naturally in the environment at levels that can be above cleanup standards. It's particularly a problem on Aquinnick Island more than some other portions of Rhode Island but it's a, it's a problem everywhere to varying degrees. What we asked of DEM was for these bud soils, the shaping and grading soils, could we take a higher level of arsenic if it was naturally occurring? No other hazardous substances in the samples, no regulatory seeds, just soil that had elevated arsenic in it. DEM gave us an approval to take soil that was up to 45, uh, 40 parts per million total arsenic in the soil as a high, an average of that soil volume of 20, and that's compared to a typical residential standard of seven parts per million. So that, that, that sort of um, approval to amend the bud gave us a little bit more room to take in a little bit more soil um, to provide that shaping and grading portion of the cap. And this uh, soil that has um, elevated arsenic as far as the residential goes, not commercial industrial, that soil is covered up, correct? Yes, it is. Everything's uh, under two feet of residential soil at this point. Okay. And have all the soils that are needed for the cap been brought into the site? 
Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, they've been brought in and we have two feet across the entire site right now. And we have a stockpile of extra soil as well. And has there been groundwater monitoring and um, uh, soil gas monitoring at the site? Yep. Uh, typical with landfills, you want to do uh, some long-term monitoring. We started monitoring a portion of the site in 2017. Um, about a year and a half ago, we uh, completed our monitoring stations. We have eight stations now around the perimeter of the site for groundwater sampling and soil gas sampling. It's done on a quarterly basis. Okay. And are there other reports that have been submitted to RIDEM? Uh, yes, as, as part of our original approval, going back to 2010, we made quarterly reports uh, to DEM on the volume of soil we were taking in, the soil data associated with that, and the source of where that soil came from. And uh, has RIDEM inspected the site uh, during implementation of the remedy? Yes, they've been out there various times during the operation period. And what's the current status of the implemented remedy? Uh, we have two feet of soil across the entire site at this point. Um, we do not, what we need to do still is finish grading. You know, we have a, a site plan that's very engineering oriented, certain grades. You want the stormwater to grow and uh, go in a certain direction. We still need to do that finished grading on the site and then we need to vegetate it as well. Um, and is, is Rydam aware that uh, of this proposal that we're presenting here tonight? Have yes. you had any discussions with Rydam on that? Yes, I have okay. several times. Several times. Um, and um, does uh, Rydam uh, allow, uh, if this were to be approved by the town, would they allow the final portion of the remedy, the final grading and shaping to take place simultaneously with the capping and the development. Yes. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there, but you don't have any documentation to that, right? We do. We you do. We, we have a letter that we included in your package. I have a letter that, that basically said the only outstanding action remaining is completion of all landfill closure, um, not including submitting the closure report. But I also believe there's another document saying that any modification place a recreational facility at site will have to undergo public notice and public hearing. Yes, and that's so, what I said in my introductory yeah. remarks. So you don't have approval to do oh, it. Oh, no, we, okay. we do not. I'm, I'm saying what we're trying to demonstrate is that that is, if they were to approve it, it's allowed to be done simultaneously to both close the, the landfill and develop. Plan. It's okay. a possibility. We don't have the approval from RIDEM. We will have to seek that. Right. Okay, so that was my next question to you. So what would need to be done with RIDEM? If we were to get an approval from the town, what would be the next step with RIDEM? Uh, we, would submit an we would submit an application to am our amend our 2010 remedial action work plan. We've done that twice already during the project. We did it once in 2014 when we found waste in an area that we originally didn't think there was waste. And then we amended it again in 2009, uh, I think 2019 or so around there, because we wanted to try to reconfigure the landfill to take in a little bit less soil and, and quicken the capping process. Um, okay. As part of that um, remedial action work plan modification process, Will the public get an opportunity to comment? Um, will there be a public hearing? Will there be a public meeting? Yes. During our discussions with DEM about the uh, the capping and how to how to deal with the proposal for the volleyball court, they've made it clear, and it's it's in a letter that I believe you have that that says there'll be a public hearing uh, once we submit the uh, the proposal to amend the work plan. Um, and then uh, finally, in your opinion, is an outdoor recreational facility an appropriate reuse of a former landfill? Uh, sure. It, it's, it's done quite often, you know, off the top of my head. Uh, Woonsocket and West Warwick have one right now in one of the, on their old municipal landfills. Um, there's a lot of things you can construct, construct on top of a landfill. You know, you, you have your two feet of clean soil, you know, so anyone that's using that surface that's on top of the two feet of clean that's essentially the same exposure you would get in a residential backyard. And will RIDEM as part of its subsequent permitting process, if we get there, will they ensure that whatever construction or you know structures are put on the property will be 
um, not jeopardizing the cap that's been approved. Yeah, so what we're proposing, the cap's two feet of soil, it's in place, we're gonna do some finished grading. Whatever Arthur builds on top of it is gonna be on top of the cap. So that's beach soil, all those sort of other amenities are on top of the cap. So that's two feet plus, um, which actually um, we didn't get to it, but this is a good time to mention it. We have excess soil, residential compliant soil on the site right now, and we're proposing to use that to sort of, um, sort of thicken the cap, if you will. Um, that'll, you know, a two foot cap will probably be a two and a half foot cap by the time we're done. And have you also had discussions about um, geotextile cover over this residential clean soil that would be underneath the sand for the volleyball courts? Yeah, uh, during one of my conversations with DEM, they suggested we use a geotextile and put that essentially as an underlayment before we start bringing any of the improvement that's being discussed here tonight. So essentially the cap will have something on top of it and then everything else is on top of that. Um, other than what you've just testified to on the RIDEM subsequent permitting, will there be other permitting at a state okay. level that will be required? Uh, sure, Coastal's, uh, Coastal Resources Management Council, we've gotten two assents already from them. We'll have to apply for them just like we have when we're applying, when we're doing our uh, original remedial action work plan, and then the Department of Transportation as well. And uh, does the current CRMC permit um, that's part of the package for the board um, already approve the access road yes. from the state's perspective? Yes, it does. The access road and the use of that soil stockpile. Okay, thank you. And, and what is the specified material for that access road? Crushed stone. Is it? Okay. Yes. <laughs> right, never mind. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. We'll we'll ask Adi about that. Uh, okay. So those are all the questions I have for Mr. O'Connor about the RIDEM regulatory process to close the landfill and what we would need to do for subsequent permitting. Are there any questions for him before I call my next witness? Hey, Leah, can you pull up a couple of those pictures I took? Yes. Give me a second. So you're aware I was on the site the other day, the gate was wide open. So I took the opportunity to walk out there, which by the way, for the record, there's a padlock on the chain, but it's my understanding that there's a broken link. So you can just, anyone could open that gate. You may want to secure it. Yeah. So can you tell me what we're looking at here? Uh, it looks like you're standing on top of our uh, excess soil stockpile. Is that the excess soil? Yes. And that's what would be used to spread. So this edge cliff type thing won't be there. No, it's, 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 it's just there because that's how the soil was dumped on the site. That's okay. residentially dumped. And that's soil. what would be spread across the rest of the... Right. We have engineer plan in place to essentially meet the current gradings. Uh, There's pattern. another one that kind of shows the um, pragmites. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so right there, there's a whole bed of Phragmites there. Phragmites tell me it's wetland. It's in the middle of the landfill. Is that considered wetland? Uh, that's not something I'm an expert in, but based on the DM approval that we have in place, I would say that the wetlands program would not have an interest in it under these circumstances, because we want to, that's essentially a symptom of a problem. Right now, we haven't completed our finished grading on the site, so we have little puddles there and here and there and elsewhere, what we want to do is finish the grading on the site because you, you don't want ponds on top of a landfill. You don't want a wetland on top right. of the landfill. You want it to grade off and drain right. well. Okay. All right. Thanks. Good way for now. Anybody else have any other questions? All set. We're going to take a uh, five minute recess before we move on to the next. And thank you for everyone for your oh, no, patience no, no. so That's far. Right. No.
Zoning Board of Review is back in session. Where did we go? Ish comes. <laughs> Everybody's watching you. <laughs> All right, zoning board review is back in session. Uh, Mr. Venker, you want to go ahead with your? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to call next. Uh, Audi Osgood from Deprete Engineering. And um, similar to my last expert witness, I do have resumes. Would you like to have them now as I'm doing the voir dire or when I conclude it? Nope, we'll take them now. Okay. Thank you. We'll put this as applicants exhibit two. Thank you. Here we go. Okay. Could we have them sworn? Sure. Thank you. So we tell the truth. I do. Full name and address for Heather, please. Audie Osgood. Uh, 137 Ferry Road, Saunderstown, Rhode Island. Mr. Osgood, who Could are you? Key into the mic a little bit when you speak, please. I know it's tough when there's two people, but. Uh, Mr. Osgood, could you tell me with whom you're currently employed? I work for Depreet Engineering in Cranston, Rhode Island. And what is your title there? Senior Project Manager. And Mr. Osgood, what do you do for Depreet Engineering? Uh, work on a variety of civil engineering site development projects uh, from single family residential to the uh, Amazon facility that's been going in in Johnston now. Okay, so a variety of um, residential, commercial, and industrial projects? Yes, okay. yes. I also did a, spent a fair amount of time working on the uh, Chevron site in East Providence, the old tank farm, the Gulf site, and the remediation work that was there. Um, and you've uh, done projects in numerous cities and towns. Yes. Uh, for how long have you been uh, working in this capacity for Deprete Engineering? Uh, 15 plus years now. Okay. And what did you do before that? I worked uh, for Deprete Engineering as a project engineer. I've also worked at several other engineering firms in different states. Uh, doing similar type of works? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you hold any professional licenses? I do. I'm licensed okay. in the state of Rhode Island. Okay. As a professional engineer? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you belong to any societies? Um, American Society of Civil Engineers and uh, Professional Engineering Society. Thank you. Um, and would you describe your post-high school education? I have a bachelor's of science degree in civil engineering from the University of New Haven in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and I'm handing to you a document, if you could please identify that. Yes, that's my resume. Okay. And does this resume, which I've provided copies of uh, to the board, set forth the qualifications as far as your uh, work experience, education, and licenses that you've just testified to? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, and uh, I would ask, or did you already mark it as an exhibit? It's Mr. marked Ron? as exhibit okay. number Thank two. You. Thank you. Um, so now at this point, I'd like to move to qualify Mr. Osgood as a Rhode Island civil engineer with expertise in site design, permitting, and construction of commercial projects. I'll make a motion to uh, accept him as an expert witness. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, so before we begin, um, so Mr. Osgood's going to walk us through what I've referred to as the revised site plan. That is the 13 sand or beach volleyball courts. 
Um, he's got uh, paper copies for each of the board members um, and we sent it um, to uh, the planner earlier today so she can put it up on the screen for the audience to see. Um, can I approach? Absolutely. We'll mark this applicant's exhibit three. Okay. Now, for the record, Mr. Venko, this revised site plan was not part of the original advertised petition. Correct. Um, this was not part of the original application. Before I, let me let me look at the notice itself. Well, I have what's in the packet, which would have been what was advertised. Yeah, it doesn't make any reference uh, to the number of ports in the notice. However, the documentation that anyone in the community wanted to preview prior to tonight would not have been this, correct? Right. It's a less intensive use. Um, so, but I agree. But my point is, yes, so, but my point is that you brought it again here tonight. Yes. A re fully revised plan that the public has not had an opportunity to see, correct? Well, that's a yes say, or a yeah, no. no. That's a yes or a no. Okay. Yes or a no. Yeah. Okay. They, Thank you. they will see it here now. Um, and it's, do you know, do you know how much time I spent just pouring over this one, let alone they're going to get to see it tonight? Okay. I, I just, go ahead. Can, can go I, ahead. can I just point out that the footprint is the same and it's the only difference as far as just taking out that beach soccer field and leaving the 13 courts. I just, I, and Mr. Osgood will testify to that. Um, and this will make it consistent uh, with our traffic study. It was an oversight, we apologize. If, okay, if so- If I could approach, I could easily circle the two minor changes that we made. That no, nope. that's okay. Okay, all right, so putting it up, okay. Well, no, there's a fence here. 
This is a fence. Oh, um, that is the coastal feature. See it over there? Okay. That's what it is. Coastal. Oh, it wasn't a revised one. We wouldn't be waiting. Hey, we got it. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. We're back. Um, Mr. Osgood, uh, we've been referring to the. Uh, Are you finished over there? Are you done, Mr. Hall? Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Osgood, you heard the exchange between myself and the chair about the site plan submitted um, with the application and then the so-called uh, revised site plan, which we've passed out copies of and is up here um, right now on the screen. Um, can you, um, did, first of all, did you prepare the site plan that was submitted originally with the app application in April? Yes, I did. Okay. And did you prepare um, the revised site plan? Yes, I did. Okay. And can you um, tell this board what the difference is between the site plan submitted in April and the site plan that we've provided here just now? Yes. 
the uh, beach soccer court that was shown on the original submission has been replaced with three beach volleyball courts and the four beach volleyball courts closest to the office trailer have been replaced with a single volleyball court. So for a total of thir there are now 13 volleyball courts shown and no soccer area or court shown. So we, we simply the, the perimeter of the sand area is unchanged on the site it has not been relocated the size hasn't changed at all we simply reconfigured the facilities within that box to be limited to three volleyball courts at, in in the current configuration are there any questions about that change before i have mr osgood go through the site plan as a whole yep go ahead because i also so when i look at the Correct. I think the operations plan and how the the uh, operator wants to use the facility is what would stop that. Just like whether he were to take three volleyball courts and turn them into one soccer. I mean, this you could easily do four soccer uh, fields on this at the, the same time. That would just be an operations choice. It was for symmetry, right? Correct, yes. Just to, to, to minimize the changes in this plan to, to reflect that this, this area could be configured slightly differently than what we have now. We could leave larger aisles in between the sand or in between the beach volleyball courts that, that, that are there now just to provide a little bit more space. And that wouldn't allow the configuration of, of you know, four courts on here. So um, could you identify throughout this package where this change affects the text of the other artifacts in this in this package? Uh, I believe the only place that that this change has any other direct correlation is in the traffic assessment and that this change was made to be more in line with and more consistent with that text. So I don't think there's any trickle down to any other documents from from this. I think this is the end of the trickle down. Yes. Okay, so so the operations plan matches this revised drawing. The operations plan calls for 13 courts with potential uh, secondary uses. Yes. It could be a beach uh, soccer court. It could be a beach tennis court. It could be a beach, what, what do you call sand, um, agility or strength training. So those are the secondary, potential secondary uses if there is more of a demand for that. Again, you open it, we don't quite know what the demand is going to be. And but with tennis, that's the, the two on two. With um, the soccer, it's five. And, and do those alternative uses affect the number of people who are on the site? So, yes, the, well, the most would be the soccer that would be five as opposed to, you know, we're talking about four total for a volleyball court, for a soccer court, it would be five. That's a little less than half of what a regular soccer team would be. But that is going to take up the space of three volleyball courts. And if you look at our traffic report, that is called out. So there's a column that says the 13 volleyball courts. There's a column that says 10 volleyball courts with one soccer court. Okay. No, it's five people total on the court. Oh, it's five per side. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Soccer is five per side. But again, going back to what we discussed earlier, where the same two v two. However, it could be four v four, five v 
v5 6v6 if i rent it as a league it's up to me to decide how many we're going to play each side right so there would be then to answer your concern that there would be this limitless amount of people that could come onto the site we would agree to conditions that limit it to the number of people to the two by two by two for the regular operating condition. Um, I think that we've we've called out in our traffic study that there could be the occasional tournament, which would be four by four. That gives you 80 cars during peak hour. So that's the most that we've spec'd out the four by four for a an occasional tournament but as you know this board has the power to impose conditions that we would then have to follow in the yeah, we're fully aware in the 80 the the 80 um i don't remember whether it was cars or trips or or, or what the it, yeah it's trip generation oh, okay so it generates 80 trips at the max during peak hour okay. So that would okay. get if you, if you would have the tournament the yes we'll get right. to that right. yeah. Maybe. yeah okay <laughs> okay yeah. All, right. all right so i'd like to have mr osgood walk us through the revised site plan to talk about the setbacks to talk about the berm to talk about the fencing um and so he'll just kind of walk through it um and then at the end of that or if you want to interrupt that's fine and you can ask questions about you know what we're proposing the location the materials setbacks so please go ahead uh yes yeah, so just some sort of big picture items on the the site step up. yes uh so the site is just over 20 acres in total uh we're proposing about seven acres would be used just over that in the area that you can see from the the fence on the i just call it top right of the the parking area the the site fronts as you can see on park avenue on the on the bottom left with the existing curb cut there for the existing access road into the into the site there's also frontage on mason avenue approximately 385 feet there's approximately 350 feet of frontage on park avenue uh, because of it the multiple parcels on this site there are also a couple of other access points that could be uh, there are frontage on streets. I don't want to even call them access points, uh, but there's one at Highland Avenue and then on Russell Avenue as well. There's some frontage. So there's no proposal to access the site from those points at, at, at all, just for general reference of the site. Uh, along the eastern side of the property, uh, where it's not abutting those uh, right of ways, it's residential uh, development along the, that eastern side. The western side is all an undeveloped parcel that's primarily uh, salt marsh and coastal waters. And there is a 200 foot coastal jurisdiction that comes onto the site from, from that western side of the site. Those, uh, there's approximately 2,600 feet of, of uh, property line along that coastal salt marsh. Uh, just beyond that, a little farther to the west, about 500 feet west of our site entrance is Boyd's Lane, which is uh, also a state road as is Park Avenue, obviously so. And across Park Avenue from the site is the uh, the, the beach and the Sakonet River. So uh, as we've already discussed at length, the site was formerly used as a, as a landfill. Now we saw some from the some of the pictures earlier that it's primarily vegetated with uh, grasses and scrub vegetation at this point in time things have filled in naturally in some areas some portions of the site have been seeded along uh, especially the perimeter slopes have been seeded to, to stabilize those uh, slopes the phragmites that you uh, had the photograph of uh, there are multiple criteria and I'm not a wetlands biologist but there are multiple criteria as to what de determines if a uh, wetland is, occurs or not, one of them is the vegetation, the other is the soils, which I would think it would be pretty unlikely that we would have soils on the site due to the nature of, of what's been brought in that would meet that criteria. But even if they did, uh, that would be a non-jurisdictional wetland as uh, 
Mr. O'Connor pointed out, because it's in an active construction area because of the, the permit for this, DM would not take jurisdiction over that. I've dealt with that on a couple of other sites in the past. So um, the site drains from the bottom right to the top left, I'll say. So along the this uh, bottom side, you can see these the contour lines where they're quite a bit thicker is, is the slope. Um, above that, you can see there's a couple of dashed lines, parallel lines out through that are labeled uh, 16 and a half, which is the sort of the top of a, a berm that we anticipated on that eastern side that would uh, water would then sheet across the site from from east to west. It would be a what we call a sheet flow. There's no concentrated flows. There's no pipes. There's no catch basins. We want to keep the water as dispersed as possible on the site. None of the improvements proposed are per are are sorry. None of the improvements are impervious. So everything on site would be pervious. So there's no increase in runoff on the site or rate of runoff. So there are no stormwater controls or BMPs proposed for the site. The both the sand courts and the pervious stone will help slow down any runoff that would be coming off the site. So while we're not quantifying it, uh, it would be an improved condition from a, from a runoff standpoint will help stabilize the site. Um, and there is uh, in that bottom, bottom corner, bottom right corner, uh, there's some, a line with some triangles around that. That was an area that was formerly mapped as uh, jurisdictional wetlands. There were a number of jurisdictional wetlands that were removed during the uh, capping of the landfill. That area is sort of in and out of that that area, so that jurisdictional boundary will thank you will will end up being revised with the completion of the capping plan for the site. That area does not drain to the to the west. Obviously, the water just has been cut off the the flow path for that. So that area is an isolated little uh, low area that's adjacent to, to Mason Avenue and, and those residences in that area. Otherwise, the entire capped area of the site uh, drains to the, to the west. Um, as we've mentioned before, a PAP will be required from DOT uh, for the change in use for the site. We're not proposing to make any changes to the driveway itself. There wouldn't be any um, actual physical modifications uh, to the, to the, within the right of way. The driveway itself is already uh, permitted through the, the CRMC uh, permit for the cap. And there are some minor revisions to be done with the regrading of that and maintenance of it, but no no changes are proposed, so. Um, thank you. Yeah, one of the other things uh, I wanted to, to point out is uh, setbacks on the site. Uh, they vary from, uh, one, uh, sorry, between 10 feet and 30 feet, depending on which zone you're in, if it's the residential or commercial. And uh, we we provided those in the uh, application and they're noted on the, the plan here. Uh, typically setbacks would be measured to a structure or proposed uh, building, uh, something of that nature on the site. But in this case, we don't have any proposed permanent structures. So we've We've measured our setbacks to either the uh, sand court areas or the parking areas, and uh, the the greatest setback we would need to meet is 30 feet, and the least amount of setback we've proposed is 80 feet. So most of the setbacks are significantly more than that, and the setbacks from any of the or the separations, I'll say, from the proposed parking and and court areas is over 200 feet to the nearest residence, to the actual nearest building. Um, so I, I think that's worth noting that there's significantly more than what would be required for uh, traditional development on the, on the site. And can you again describe um, looking from, I'll say kind of the Mason Avenue side, uh, what that topography is looking up into the landfill. Sure, so there's Mason Avenue uh, is roughly at an elevation of six to eight feet above sea level. The top of that embankment, as I mentioned, is 
16 and a half. So it's eight to 10 feet above Mason Avenue or above Park Avenue to the to the top of that slope. Um, it'll be a, a little bit higher uh, in the final condition than it is today. There's some minor regrading to be done along that side to create that berm and, and help continue to direct the water um, from east to west across that site. So you won't be able to stand on, on either Street Park or Mason and see onto the, the court areas. You'll be able to potentially see the fence you know, above that where, where it sticks up, but you won't be able to see even level with the playing fields at all, so. Any questions for Mr. Osgood? I do. Um, I don't know if anyone else does. I've got a couple. Um, you said the existing driveway stays. Yes. Uh, as it exists, you can only get one vehicle down it. There's no way two vehicles could pass. So I did say that it stays in that location, but the, the CRMC permit did allow for us to do some minor regrading and reworking of that, that driveway. So what so, will the width of the driveway be? I think it's proposed at 18 feet, 18 or 20. dimension on it there's a dimension on there maybe leah could zoom in on what is it a little bit 23 um, okay thank you your eyes are a lot better than mine though um, so there's a lot in fact i rumor has it from people that were on site there's right now there's like wood chips like two feet deep there that go over to the side i think even towards mason avenue in that way is all that going to be removed or? I believe there were some uh, some wood chips placed on the site that were intended to be incorporated into the, the capping, uh, sort of as a mulch kind of thing. I think the intent was to use them for, uh, to be spread to help with, uh, I don't want to say this, I'm not, a, I'm not a landscape guy, but. Well, this isn't some. <laughs> this no, is, but when you. This is a lot. If I'm just I wondering what happens to that. I mean. Does that all get removed and new material brought in? No, no, it no, all the, stays on site. The, it all stays on site. I'm not, I believe the intent was to mix that with some of the other capping materials to just put some more additional organic matter into the into the uh, final capping materials. So but what I'm not when that decomposes? Well, it'll be mixed with the existing soil. But it'll decompose and compress, correct? I mean, I'm not well, a rocket scientist, but I know when wood rots, you know, it kind right. of compresses. But it's it's there's still two thirds of the site that won't have any proposed development on it at this time. And I, from what photos I've seen, if you were to spread those wood chips out over this site, you probably wouldn't have an inch of them in thickness by the time they were mixed and, and spread out over the the site. So if they rotted away by a half, you you know, things would settle a half an inch over the course of the or over the the area of the site. So, okay. Questions? Go ahead. So some of this I'd like to have addressed by Mr. O'Connor, who is the one who's the project manager for the closure of the landfill and performance of the remedy. So some of these questions are better directed to him. Audie's been working on the this site for a long time. He's capable. Uh, but I really want it directed to Tim as the appropriate expert. So um, we were talking about the height and falling down the yeah, slope. Yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, it's definitely, sorry. Um, yes, it, it's definitely steep and, and that's going to be a challenge, but we're going to have to vegetate it. I mean, it does have quite a bit of vegetation on it now in some locations, but not throughout it. Um, you know, we would certainly perhaps do um, something with a tackifier and seed mixed in with it that would sort of solidify it in place. 
Um, we have other areas that we've done that already and it's, it's helped. And, but there's no firm plan in place yet then to what, if, if I understand what you say is said, we'll have to address it, look at it and possibly we can do this, but there's no plan that shows exactly what's going to be done. Well, if I can jump in. Okay. Sure. So I, I think there's that, slope is substantially in place now. There may be some minor rework to do to, to finalize it. It's a proposed slope at a three to one ratio, which is typical for land development work. That's about the, what we consider to be the steepest slope that you can actually mow with the riding mower equipment. So it's the same sort of slope that you would have on any other development that would come in here. We routinely propose slopes that are two to one that would be handled with vegetation that wouldn't need to be mowed but the slopes on this site are, are three to one. So no steeper than what we would use if we were proposing a bank or a school or any other type of land development, so. And, and we'll have this security fence that will prevent people from going off into the- Yes. Into the, the steeper parts of that. Right. Right. Yes, correct. The, the slope isn't, can, the slope isn't steep enough to be considered any sort of a, a safety hazard or anything like that. There's no regulatory standard or anything. We, we routinely design slopes like this with no, uh, you know, no barrier at the top of it. So it, 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 I mean, it would be a great place to, you know, if it were your backyard, it'd be a great place to ride your toboggan. It'll, I agree with you that it's, you know, there's a pretty good slope to it, but it's not a safety hazard in any way. Uh, and again, um, you know, a lot of these questions about, you know, how is it going to be spread across the site? Um, you know, where is it going to go? This is all the subject of subsequent DEM permitting, which we won't do if we don't get approval. If we get approval, we will do it. So I want to assure you that we will plan these things out and apply for a modified remedial action work plan that will contemplate these things and the public will get an opportunity to comment on it. My question is, it may be allowed, but I think we will be meant to if we have the changing elevation of the trees in the garden. So we all know that that's down. So here we've got this which that may be allowed, but it means if I have little kids in that neighborhood and I was that too close, that could kill me. <laughs> So it's more of a, um, whether it's allowed or not, it's just to me, it's changing what I think needs to be in. Okay. Mr. Becker, may I ask you a question? So let's go out on the limb here and let, let's say that hypothetically, this is approved by the board. You have to go to the state to get the modification. Now the state, makes you move X, Y, and Z, which means the petition that was granted is not what was granted because the state just told you, you've got to move things, which would be not with this board approved. Sure. So now you would have to come back again. Sure. Right. I mean, that's, that's the case. Modification to a previously approved special use permit. So it's which came first, the chicken or the egg, correct? Yeah, if there's a material modification, we have to come back to you. Right. If it's not material, I, I understand you can do it administratively, but um, that is the case with any municipal- no, no, I just, yeah. I just- I, I agree with you. We would have to come back, yes. Okay. If it's material. Okay. Sure. Uh, um, Mr. O'Connor, um, uh, uh, off of Mission Avenue, uh, uh, the line with the triangles on it, does that represent a low spot? Uh, not, not directly. Yeah. It represents uh, the edge of what was delineated uh, in 2013, I believe, as, as a wetland area. Okay. It, so, it, but, but, but it's a wetland, it's a potential wetland area with no access to the sea. Oh, correct. So, like a, like a marsh. Uh, so yeah. so so water flowing um, off that berm will come down into that. 
Correct. Anything that's coming that comes down that slope, obviously, will end up at that at point in the bottom. That won't. Nothing will change about that. That's okay. that's okay. existing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and is it a standing water feature for much of the year now? Uh, that I couldn't speak to as well as the number of the residents. I'm sure I I I've not been out there myself and seen standing water in it, but I've okay. not spent that much time. Okay. No. Would you expect it to get um, wetter? with the completion of the project? No, I would not expect the amount of runoff going to that to change at all. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, I would next like to bring up our architect. This is um, Melissa Hutchinson. And um, if I could have her sworn. Sure. Raise your right hand, swear to tell the truth. I do. Full name and address for Heather, please. Melissa Hutchinson, 203 Hooper Street, Tiverton, Rhode Island. And may I approach with her resume? Sure. This is going to be exhibit number four. That's right. Thank you. Ms. Hutchinson, are you currently employed? I am. I have my own business. Um, I am the sole proprietor of MH Architect LLC, and I'm also an adjunct uh, faculty member teaching architecture at Roger Williams University. Okay. And what type of work do you do as part of your sole proprietorship? <laughs> uh, mainly, I work on high-end residential, multifamily, and also commercial um, it, on Aquidneck Island and primarily in Tiverton and Little Compton. And do you hold any professional licenses? Um, I've been a registered architect in the state of Rhode Island for 23 years, and I also am part of the American Institute of Architects Rhode Island chapter. Okay, and can you describe your post high school education? Um, I have a five year Bachelor of Architecture from Roger Williams University. Okay, and you mentioned that um, you are an adjunct. Uh, faculty member with the School of Architecture? That's correct. And for how long has that been? Um, I've been teaching there uh, for 13 years. And are you familiar with the design and layout of beach volleyball facilities? Yes, so um, I've been playing volleyball myself more than 30 years. I, I continue to play. Um, I've, I've coached at the college level and uh, multiple youth programs locally on the island. And have you worked on other sports complexes? Um, so I have been working on the Longplex uh, sports, indoor sports facility in Tiverton with Jim Long for the last two years. Okay. And um, have you been qualified as an expert by this board in the past as an architectural expert? I have. Um, most recently, you guys qualified me for the Ocean State Air Solutions Project on East Main Road. I'd like to hand to you this document, if you could please identify it. Um, this is my resume. Okay. And does it set forth the uh, qualifications that you just testified to as far as experience, education, and licenses? It does. Okay. Um, and it's been marked as an exhibit, so I'd like to move now to have Ms. Hutchinson um, qualified as an expert in architecture uh, with knowledge of design and layout of beach volleyball facilities. There we are. <laughs> Make a motion to recognize Melissa Hutchinson as an expert in architectural, I'm going to put it as architectural engineering. Okay. And Could second I that. <laughs> Motion has been made and second to accept. Uh, Melissa Hutchinson is an expert in architectural engineering. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Let's go. Okay. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there's been um, some architectural renderings um, that has been done. Um, they're not part of your package. They're demonstrative exhibits that I'd like Ms. Hutchinson to walk this board through and have projected up onto your screen. No. We're doing that. Okay. Did you guys do a Okay. Okay. Um, so before you say something, Mr. Nan, I want to point out that this, this, this rendering has the original site plan configuration, mm -hmm. but as you heard from Mr. Osgood, it's the same footprint, right, as the revised plan. The footprint did not change. So I, when we're looking at these aerial photo um, renderings, and there are two of them, that's what I want people to focus on the footprint. Okay. Um, and so if you can describe for us um, first how these renderings came about and how they were generated. So essentially uh, we used a drone to take photographs, aerial photographs of the site. Um, so what you're seeing around the site is uh, basically was just taken within the last week. Um, and so essentially what we do is take Audi's plan so that everything is to scale from an AutoCAD drawing, and we convert that into three dimensions in SketchUp, and then we render it so that it has a realistic view. And we can place the camera wherever we want to make sure that we get true eye level views. That would be you know, driving by in a car at eye level, walking by at eye level. So these first two renderings um, are basically pictures that were taken with the drone, and then we overlaid um, the new plan for the development onto that um, southern side of the site. Okay, so um, why don't you just, if you can explain, these were prepared under your supervision, correct? That's correct. Okay, um, and can you explain, um, just orient the board, I know we can all see it, um, as to, you know, where the courts are, the access road, the parking lot, um, and uh, and then, you know, any other features um, as far as Mason Avenue, just orient the board. Of course. Um, so as, as you may know, the site, the overall site um, is kind of shaped like a boomerang or a stealth bomber. Um, and so you can see that the, um, the portion of the site that we're proposing for the development is closer to Park Ave, which you can see uh, running kind of north to south on the, on the right-hand side of the photo. Um, you can also start to see where the beach is looking out to the Saconet River. Um, so the, this flag shape kind of with the bubble at the end is the crushed gravel um, access way. And then we have kind of a turnaround at the end, which is also um, a radius that would be useful for the fire department to get in, to get access and to be able to turn around and get out of the site. So you can see that the 13 courts 
are closest to Park Ave. And then we have three small temporary buildings um, that will be used for office, storage, and restrooms. And then behind those buildings um, is the parking. And then to the, the north of that, you can see um, kind of this M shape where we've got existing wetlands. Um, so those wetlands are already there, they're already vegetated, and those exist between the residential area um, and then past those is the berm up to the top of the cap. Um, so the, the street that's kind of running adjacent to our lot um, is Mason Street coming into Park Ave. And then I'd just like to add that the, the basically when we were designing the courts, um, we were thinking about the views from the site um, and in terms of maximizing um, the playability of the courts, um, also thinking about the direction of the wind, the direction of the sun, um, because that very much plays into, you know, we don't want necessarily people looking directly into the sun when they're playing. Um, so all of that was considered um, in the placement of the courts. Okay, and then you have a, a second aerial view that's, is it a little closer? Okay. Yep, so this is um, essentially the same view, um, just blown up. And um, basically what you're starting to see on the upper side of the court um, is that existing vegetated wetland area between the residential uh, neighborhood and our site. Um, and we're also, so we're proposing to have two fences. Uh, one fence we're referring to as the perimeter fence. And so that goes all the way around the site. Um, and and you'll, you can see that already in place from Park Ave, that's a black chain link fence. And then we'll also have a security fence. So the security fence, which you can also see on Audie's plan, um, is a fence that goes more directly. I don't know who's speaking back there, but it's getting very annoying. Appreciate your patience so far. Oh, please continue. Thank you. So uh, like I said, there's there's essentially a perimeter fence, which is on the, the outside perimeter of the lot. And then there'll be also a security fence, which will be um, much closer to the courts themselves. And then you can kind of see this um, angular line um, just above where the courts are. Um, so that is part of the security fence. And we're proposing that there would be a, a, a windscreen, a mesh windscreen that would be on that fence, um, which would help to provide a windbreak um, for the volleyball players. And it also provides a little bit more of a visual buffer between the residential neighborhood um, looking up to the courts. Okay, could you go to the next? Okay, so this is a view as if you were coming in on that new gravel driveway. Um, that driveway is there, but it, it'll be crushed stone. And so you're starting to see the, um, essentially the security fence that will be around the courts. So this is if you were driving um, up that aisle and then looking off to the right, you're seeing through the security fence um, and you can start to see the, the volleyball courts and then the three uh, temporary buildings in the background. Um, you can also see, see through the courts um, to the, the existing kind of vegetative buffer, low shrubs and trees that are kind of um, beyond where that wetland area is. And then we wanted to show yeah. an eye level perspective. Oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead. How tall is that security fence? So um, our proposal was to have uh, a six foot fence. That one or the security fence on the opposite side? Oh, this, this one closest to us. Yeah. Oh, it, it just didn't look very tall. I, I think this is actually rendered as a four foot fence. So the, the six foot fence is the perimeter fence that goes around and then the security fence would be a four foot tall fence. And that would be the one that would have the, the windscreen material that would be on the residential Mason Street side. So, so this fence that we're seeing is, is four feet? Four feet tall. And then we wanted to provide another view from Park Ave so that people would understand what they would be seeing kind of driving by the site. And so this is actually very similar to what you would see now. Um, so in the upper left, you can kind of see just a peek through of the Mount Hope Bridge as kind of a reference point. Um, so here is our six foot chain link fence. Um, you can see the existing sidewalk and then um, basically that 12 foot berm going from the sidewalk level up to the top of the cap once the, the finished grading is complete. Um, so I know we're not seeing much here more than what you see today, um, but essentially we're trying to show that 
um, because there is that 12 foot grade change that from Park Ave itself, um, you really don't get a very clear view of the courts themselves. And then this final view is again, an eye level perspective. Um, so if you were standing with the new, those new um, small buildings to your back and you're looking out um, through the courts, essentially you're at the top of the cap, um, you're looking through um, you know, the, the players fields and out towards the Sakonet River and out to the Atlantic. So you can see that um, it, it really is a beautiful site in terms of, of the views of the water. And that was the last image. Okay. Um, so temporary buildings, what are they constructed of? How do they get there? What happens to them in the winter? So I don't know if Art, you wanna speak more directly to this? Sure, uh, why don't you come on up to the podium. They're mostly trailers. Okay. Um, you know, it would be uh, one of the nicer restrooms that are on the trailers yeah. um, and serviced by, um, by a vendor. And then the office building would be the, very similar to them, like very similar to a construction site trailer, office trailer. And then the, uh, the storage would be just a storage container. What happens to them in the winter? Um, they stay there? The, um, well, it depend on the rental agreement. Um, but I would, I would, uh, assume that the storage would stay. Okay. So they could be considered what I like to term as a temporary permanent thing, mm -hmm. i.e. it's temporary that it could be moved, but it's permanent because it's not going anywhere. Safe to say. Sure. Okay. Thank you. And, and if it helps in terms of thinking, um, like the office building would be something like a bill sales oversized shed type of building. Just like you said that it, it could be picked up and moved, but the intention is that it's going to stay there. It's going to stay there. And there's no power for, there's no power provided. Yeah. And, and no, no lighting either. So right. um, we have said that we would, we would like to have cameras for monitoring, monitoring for security. Um, so the cameras would obviously need to have lights at night, but essentially those would be on a motion detector. So they would only come on if there was activity. So those are solar powered with a- Right. Right. But we all know how motion lights really work. However, there are cameras that do work, infrared, that don't require a light to come on. Right, so it, it's almost similar to a ring doorbell type of camera where it, it basically functions in fairly low light. Right, okay. okay. Are we, we're done um, with Ms. Hutchinson? Right. Okay. Now we've got Thank you. 15 Thank you. minutes left. How would you like to proceed? Well, I'll leave that up to you. Um, uh, we, the board members have already spoken and Mr. Furell goes on vacation in August. It's fair. <laughs> but um, we are willing to have a special meeting on August 3rd to continue this, which is two weeks from tonight. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I said, we're willing to have a special meeting on August 3rd. No, finish tonight. Because we're not going to finish tonight. <laughs> we end at 10. Yes, sir. Okay, then we can continue it to September. I just got to make sure I'm here because I know I live in September. Let me check that. Let's see. And what date is that? Uh, that would be September 21st. You don't have to be here. Getting married on a Thursday? Can I, could I ask if, if you're willing to 
schedule a special meeting in August, would you do one in earlier in September if there's a coverage issue from planning? Um, I just got to, it would have to be September 7th because I know I leave on the 10th. Finish checking to see when I'm going. We don't want to have this the regular meeting. We have to do that. We don't want to have this the regular meeting. We don't want to have this the regular meeting. We don't want to have this the regular meeting. We don't want to have this the regular meeting. We don't the uh, guy just by yeah. the second yeah. of the after we get to it in August. Yeah. Oh, it's in August. It's okay. August. Yeah. September 7th, Sue? Okay. You guys good September 7th? Oh, yeah. yeah. Kevin, I know it. Yeah. yeah. All right. We can do September 7th. So that works for our team. Thank you. Okay. So that being said, First, first, could I have a motion to continue the petition to a special meeting to be held September 7th at 7 p.m.? I make a motion. Could I have a second? Second. Motion has been made and second to continue the petition of AP Associates to a special meeting to be held September 7th at 7 p.m. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Second thing I want to say is I want to thank everyone because being one of the more contentious petitions I've ever heard in 20 some odd years of doing this, this has probably been the most respectful group that we've had. So thank you very much for your patience. Okay. Again, when we reconvene on the seventh, everyone will get an opportunity that wants to speak to speak. Okay. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Seconded. Motion's been made and second to adjourn. All Thank in you. favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good. Thank you, guys. That worked out. Anyway. <laughs> Even the member that we can. Interesting. Interesting is a good way to put it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.